Holy Spirit, come to us. Kindle in us the fire of your love. Holy Spirit, come to us. Holy Spirit, come to us. Holy Spirit, come to us. Kindle in us the fire of your love. Holy Spirit, come to us. Holy Spirit, come to us. Good morning. A very warm welcome to everybody here under the canopy. Suddenly it's become a singular canopy, but um, it's fun to be in a different direction and to be starting another season. Can I invite you all now to stand as we worship together? If you've got your BCP, we'll be beginning on page 123. And if you've got your song sheet, it gives you the page numbers as well for the psalm that we'll be reading later on. Um, and the collect of the day. So you might want to just find those and stick your fingers in them. But now, let us begin to worship together. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desire is known. And from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Bless the Lord, my soul. And bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, who leads us into life. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless God's holy Bless the Lord, my soul, who leads us into life. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless God's holy name. Bless the pray the collect for the day which you can find on page 621 right near the back of your books of common prayer page 621 the lord be with you and with your spirit let us pray together almighty and everlasting god you govern all things both in heaven and on earth mercifully hear the supplications of your people and in our time grant us your peace through jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god 
forever and ever. Amen. And now we're going to pray for our children. Uh, if you've got one in your eyeballs or if you're near somebody, feel free to reach out your hand towards them. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the children that you have blessed us with in this congregation. Thank you for the role each one of us has in helping to shepherd them, to grow to know and love you more dearly. And we pray for them as they continue in various levels of school and preschool and kindergarten and daycare and at home and all the places where they spend their days. We ask that you will watch over our children, that you will bless them and keep them, and that you will help them to know always that you are their good shepherd. Amen. And now we've got a new song. Yeah, so we're going to have a new song for the next few weeks for the kids. So Atrium, I can't see you, but hopefully you can hear. Um, we're not going to sing the Spanish verse this week, um, but we will sing both of the English ones. So if you know this from your childhood, please sing loudly. And if you don't, hopefully you will learn together. <laughs> so. The Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. The Lord is good to me. And every seed I sow will grow into a tree. And someday there'll be apples there for everyone in the world to share. The Lord is good to me. Amen. A reading from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 20. See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one brings suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, conceiving mischief and begetting iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs, they weave the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs dies, and the crushed egg hatches out a viper. Their webs cannot serve as clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. Their roads they have made crooked. No one who walks in them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We wait for light, and lo, there is darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope like the blind along a wall, groping like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon, as in the twilight, among the vigorous as though we were dead. We all growl like bears, like doves we moan mournfully. We wait, for sal we wait for justice, but there is none, for salvation, but it is far from us, for our transgressions before you are many and our sins testify against us. Our transgressions indeed are with us and we know our iniquities transgressing and, de and denying the Lord and turning away from following our God, taking oppression, talking oppression and revolt, conceiving lying words and uttering them from the heart. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands at a distance for truth stumbles in the public square and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and whoever turns from evil 
is despoiled. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm brought him victory, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in fury as in a mantle. According to their deeds, so, he, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, requital to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render requital. So those in the west shall fear the name of the Lord, and those in the east his glory. For he will come like a pent-up stream that the wind of the Lord drives on. And he will come to Zion as a redeemer, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join us in praying Psalm 13 responsively by whole verse. I will pray the odd verses and you will respond with the evens. How long will you utterly forget me, O Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I seek counsel in my soul and be so vexed in my heart? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes that I sleep not in death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. For if I am cast down, those who trouble me will rejoice. But my trust is in your mercy, and my heart is joyful in your salvation. I will sing of the Lord, because he has dealt so lovingly with me. Indeed, I will praise the name of the Lord Most High. A reading from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Therefore, let us go on toward perfection, leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ, and not laying again the foundation, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. Ground that drinks up the rain falling on it repeatedly and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and on the verge of being cursed. Its end is to be burned over. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints, as you still do. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end, so that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. They came to Jericho. 
As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can have a seat. Good morning. My name is my name is David and I am a deacon. Thank you. The moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> now that I'm a deacon, I'm going to open this uh, by apologizing to my children because they are now sermon fodder for the rest of their lives. Uh, including the following analogy. Um, One of the things you deal with as a parent, um, but really, parenting analogies apply to everybody because you were kids too, so take this to heart. Um, You you have to deal with your kids occasionally hitting or biting each other. Um, I doubt I'm alone in this. Um, One of the things you'll find if you read the literature in child development is that kids bite each other not just because they're bad, I'm I'm not saying that's not the case, but not just because of that, Um, but because they lack language. That these problems actually tend to resolve themselves when they have the words to process their feelings and to navigate their relationships. One of the nice things about the Bible is it's really, really big and it is full of words. And the Bible is actually a rich resource for giving us tools to process our feelings, to process how we think of our own actions and relationships. So today, I wanna tap the resources of the book of Isaiah the prophet, which is sometimes dubbed the fifth gospel, for its rich vocabulary for sin and redemption. Earlier in the book, the prophet Isaiah warned the kings of Judah to place their trust in the Lord alone, to abandon their sinful ways of oppression, or else suffer military defeat or conquest. It didn't go well. God's people end up conquered and exiled. Starting in chapter 40, we read of a new era in which God remembers his ancient promises and allows Judah's conquerors to be conquered and he moves the new rulers to allow God's people to return to their ancestral home. The last 10 chapters reflect a time shortly after God's people have returned to their land. They have already tasted redemption. Chapter 59, however, addresses the continuing reality of sin for God's people. Now, going through a chapter like this can be a real downer, an exercise unnecessarily gloomy for reading Isaiah as the fifth gospel. And often when somebody wants to speak of sin for more than a few minutes, that indicates something's wrong with them. But as one commentator has noted, rarely in scripture do we find such a rich vote for sin. And in its own way, having such a vocabulary is in itself redemptive. And that is why my sermon bears the title, In Defense of Sin. Now, I am not defending it a fact, of course. Sin is by definition bad, so please don't do it. Put down your phone before texting the bishop. (laughs) But what I do want to defend is the vocabulary for sin, or simply doing, which is all I mean by it. The vocabulary we find in scripture. 
In Isaiah 59, thank you, Grant, by the way, for enduring through that chapter. Isaiah 59 offers us a rich vocabulary here for sin because of the Bible's propensity for metaphors. And we'll talk about why that can be a valuable thing for us. First, I want to let you know that I approach this topic partially as a former writing instructor. So I'm disposed to cherish clarity of language as a cardinal virtue. As one of my own teachers used to say, clarity of writing reflects clarity of thought. I would like to make the case that clarity in our moral clarity reflects purity of heart. But first, let's address a prior question. How do we so often manage to obscure our meaning? Let me see a show of hands. Has anyone here read something in school, maybe a textbook or an article that was boring? That's what I thought. Do you want to know why academic writing is so often boring? It's actually pretty simple. It boils down to nouns, abstract nouns to be exact. So for example, you might encounter monstrosities like the amount of growth of the seedlings was directly proportional to the duration of exposure to sunlight. In addition to that sentence as being dense and opaque, nothing happens in the sentence. Of course, I would have a writing student revise it into something much simpler and concrete, not to mention interesting. The sun made the plants grow. <laughs> as silly as that example appears, we often resort to abstract language like that all the time when it comes to our own moral action. And here, I want to be clear. I speak as these things apply to me, myself. Um, one abstract noun that I have found that has kind of come in and conquered some of my vocabulary to talk about a number of things, um, sin, shame, pain, all manner of human experience, um, it's a word that you may often find yourself using too, and hopefully you're not tempted as I am, but it's the word brokenness. Now the beauty of the word brokenness lies in its flexibility. It covers a range of much broader than sin. It helps describe situations where perhaps you've been on the receiving end of sin or injustice. And while you may know that at an intellectual level you've done nothing wrong, you still feel morally damaged. So I want to first thank God that we have found a helpful way of talking about those kinds of experiences and emotions. Now, where it has crept into my head in a less helpful way is in describing actions that are, shall we say, morally suspect. Brokenness is a state of being. It is not something we do. As we'll see momentarily, scripture can give us the gift of moral clarity if we let it. It can help us pick apart our brokenness, as it were, and answer the question, who broke what? I want to emphasize here that I'm not picking on a single word. This is simply how my own weird brain works. One of my favorite examples of this problem of obscuring our actions comes from one of the greatest masterpieces of modern art, Futurama. It's a TV show. Fry and Bender were specifically told not to overload the cart they were using to make a delivery because it would break easily. They disregard those instructions and they break the cart. When they're confronted about it, Bender disclaims, some breaking occurred, the dolly was involved, that's about all we know. <laughs> it's not unlike the story of Moses and Aaron and the whole episode with the golden calf. When Moses comes down from the mountain with the law, he confronts Aaron. Aaron replies, look, we threw some gold into this fire, out came this calf, that's about all we know. <laughs> In Aaron's defense, though, Moses was the greatest sinner of all time. He broke all 10 commandments at once. When we lack the ability to name the exact nature of our offenses, it can be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to set things right. So that's the second advantage to clear language here. Someone close to me once confronted me, in a loving way, about something I had done to offend him. And in describing my role in the matter, he kept coming back to the same words, 
hurtful and hurtfulness. The situation was hurtful, he said, but he was adamant that he didn't want the conversation to be a, a blame thing. It's just that things were said or done that were hurtful. The reality, though, was that someone hurt somebody, and it wasn't until we established who, me, who had hurt someone, him, and how, disrespect, that we made any progress in the conversation. Once that was all squared away, what I had done and what this person wanted from me finally came into focus, and I could do what was necessary to reconcile. Presently, though, enhancing our vocabulary for wrongdoing enhances our vocabulary for redemption. So for example, scripture often describes sin as a burden. The lovely thing about burdens is they can be lifted. Likewise, sin is said to be a stain. The stain can be washed. Jesus himself often likened sin to a debt. And if it is a debt, then like a debt, it can be forgiven. All of which is to say, by using the, the language of the Bible itself, we can enrich and extend our language of thanksgiving for what God has done for us. Isaiah 59 and countless other passages of scripture enable us to identify and describe moral action through rich metaphors. Why would God choose to speak this way to his people? Does metaphor actually get us closer to the truth of the matter? I often resort to um, the... Th Thank you, Lord. I often... Re <laughs> I often resort to the language of, uh, he was a French philosopher named Paul Ricoeur, um, who thought a lot about how metaphors work. He said that the beautiful thing about them is metaphors make the abstract concrete. Figurative language can actually bring us closer to the truth than we otherwise could without it. So take this example. I could use less figurative language to describe my relationship with my wife. I could say, I love Jody. And to intensify that description, I could say, I love Jody a lot. And I could have her swooning if I said, I love Jody to a very great degree. <laughs> now, compare that with a more poetic mode of expression, as in Robert Burns' classic poem. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Though both modes of discourse are, strictly speaking, true, the poetic language does greater justice to the reality of my love for my wife. Of course, the scriptures are replete with such examples. Let's take Psalm 42 for, for one. The psalmist's image of the soul's desire for God goes like this. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now, which is the more concrete expression? That psalm or something like, I feel a great lack of God inside of me, a very big lack that I would like satisfied. <laughs> One of the reasons these are so much more satisfying is that metaphors are what we could say productive of meaning. They're a gift that keeps on giving. In Recur's famous words, the symbol gives rise to thought. That is, I am of course not married to a bright red flower with a bloom time in June. But by bringing two different things together, my wife, a rose, I open a fresh window onto the reality of things. So I want to approach Isaiah 59 now. Um, this is a text that we might otherwise try to avoid um, because of this, but I, I'm hoping to make a case that it is valuable for us as we try to look into scripture as a mirror as our sermon series on James turned up. First we have verses one through two. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Here we have an image of a great gulf between the people and their God, and we have the further notion that God is even hiding from them. In Psalm 13 that we read together, you have that same image, God 
do not hide your face from me. We know the people here are in some kind of distress. They need some sort of saving. But by way of reminder, in this part of Isaiah, God's people has already been redeemed from exile. They're home from Babylon by this point. So the distress is likely not some concrete historical situation, but just this feeling of separation itself. That is to say, the nation of Judah continues to sin even now. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. Hands, fingers, lips, tongue. Perhaps we don't even need to speak here of figurativeness. These are real physical things. But in any case, they are a reminder that we are embodied creatures. The list reads like an inversion of what we're supposed to do according to Deuteronomy 6, which is to bind God's words to our hands, to our feet, to our foreheads, to keep his word always in our mouths. The prophet continues, no one enters suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies. Here the prophet brings to mind a court setting. Not a single person, cries the prophet, goes to court to bring the truth to light, to make the world a more just place, or to plead an honest cause. No, these courts, indeed the entire legal system, is perverted. The reasons why are left to our imagination, though if ancient Israelite courts are anything like ours, it's not hard to fill in the details. Maybe it's to seize someone's property that's not yours. Maybe it's to take down a rival. Maybe it's to get you or your friends off the hook for something you've done. All right, the next image is my personal favorite. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing, Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. I quizzed my daughter last night on what an adder was. She knew it was a snake, and so I followed up and asked if she knew a kind, and she replied, adders are snakes that are good at math. <laughs> she makes me very proud. What I think Isaiah is going for is that these perverters of justice hatch lies like a brood of venomous snakes. An adder's eggs may look like food, but they'll kill you. Now, I can't vouch for the science behind that, but that's the idea. A spider's web may resemble thread that you could sew into garments, but it's not. It will leave you naked and cold. Thus, lies resemble the truth, but they're deadly. And lies, once hatched, bring forth more lies. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Here we're presented with the image of two paths. One path is a road that is tread by the wicked, who not only shed innocent blood, but they are impatient to get on with it. It is a path marked by destruction. The visuals from the post-apocalyptic film The Road, based on the novel by Cormac McCarthy, come to mind. To either side of this road lie ruins and ashes. The other path, the way of peace and justice, is completely foreign to them. Now, as we look at verses 9 through 13, we start to see the payoff of the concrete images used to describe the ways God's people have fallen short. It's one of the most moving, beautiful, and passionate prayers of confession in the entire Bible. This is the confession that have been inspired by those verses. The people say, Therefore justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. 
for our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. I would fail to do justice to this text by attempting to translate it out of its current poetic form, so I won't do that. If anything, the words are too clear. I will just say this. In the midst of all that powerful imagery, a single word for me stands above the rest. We. You see, in this section, there's a sudden shift in the chapter to the first person plural. The chapter began with an indictment addressed to you all, it's plural in Hebrew. Then it becomes generalized with a third person plural, they. But now, all these metaphors are brought home to we, to the people themselves. Now to be clear, these are corporate sins. But in a certain sense, the people who speak in these verses don't have to do this. They don't have to internalize all the things we've been talking about. Remember Isaiah chapters 56 through 66, they're addressed to the faithful remnant of Judah that has survived and returned from exile in Babylon. They're in their new, they're in their new old home once again. They could acknowledge what the prophet says as the sins of their community around them, or even their own mistakes from the past, but they could choose to distance themselves from this language. But, by the, but they don't. They don't say, we don't have to think about that stuff anymore. By the grace of God, we've been saved. Surely, we don't need to feel guilty about anything. No, that's not the direction God's people go here. In their confession, they take the words that came before and own it all as we. I take this to be based not in principle, but in fact. In other words, they're not owning this out of an abstract conviction that everybody in a community shares in that community's sins. Rather, they're confessing it because the prophetic words have cut them to the heart and convicted them that they do in fact bear some guilt as well. One can be part of the redeemed faithful and still sin. Thanks be to God, that is not where it ends. It is only now, after the great litany of misdeeds, that God's people have claimed for themselves and confessed that we can appreciate one of the strongest images of salvation in scripture. Yes, says verse 14, justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away. Truth has stumbled in the public square. Yes, and you know what? The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and wondered that there was no one to intercede. So what is God to do? God comes down himself. God descends to bring forth justice and truth upon the earth and to rescue his people from sin. So here are these final verses of the chapter. The Lord's own arm brought salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay, etc. Then he says, So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as small children, though we sometimes enter into conflict or bite each other, so to speak, you give us the tools to work through it. You've given us your word, all of which is effective. And we pray, God, that you would let these images sit with us for a while. That you will help us organize our own self-reflection based on how your scripture speaks of us. 
both in where we've missed the mark, but also where we can thank you and trust you that you do not leave us to our own devices, but that you come down dressed in full armor to combat our sins for us and to rescue us. We thank you for these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which you can find on page 126 of your BCPs. One, two, six. I'll give you a moment to get there. Actually, it's one, two, seven, I suppose. Let us say it together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we pray. Please join me in praying for the church and for the world. Father, we pray for the global church, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. And Lord, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, we pray that you would grant them strength, courage, and peace to endure their present circumstances. We pray for Foley, our Archbishop, and John, our Bishop, and for all the staff of Incarnation, for Liz, Amy, and Josie. Lord, give them wisdom and sensitivity to you and to the needs of the community. And God, we pray that Incarnation Anglican will be a church that finds new ways to welcome and invite others into our community and to extend your love and hospitality to neighbors, friends, and colleagues. Father, inspire us to make new connections in our community as we move worship locations in the coming months. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for our local community. In particular this week, we pray for the Larsh community in South Arlington. We thank you for the joyful presence of Larsh in our community and their continued partnership. Father, please continue to protect core members and assistants from COVID-19. And we pray for their upcoming giving day, for generosity of donors, and for your great provision for this ministry. And God, please bring more assistance into the community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation and all in authority, Lord, we pray for wisdom, clarity, and compassion in responding to the immigration crisis as a new caravan of migrants makes its way to the southern border. We pray for our leaders to have courage to pursue just policy, regardless of political cost, and for common empathy for the marginalized and the vulnerable. And God, we specifically lift up our President Joe, our congressional leaders, and governors across the nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our country of the week, Indonesia, we pray that you would strengthen the local church and give fresh encouragement to those in ministry. And God, we pray for a continued decline in COVID rates as the country reopens to tourists. And we also pray for Afghanistan, for those experiencing oppression under the new leadership of the country, and for those that <clears throat> remain vulnerable. We ask for your protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray for all those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Lord, we pray for Brian and Carol Bussey as they mourn the loss of Brian's mother, and for Rebecca and Nate Biddle as Rebecca's mother entered hospice care this week. And we pray for all those in our community that are grieving or facing medical challenges. God grant them comfort and peace. And now I invite you all to pray silently for anyone God has laid on your heart, or feel free to mention their name aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, first silently and then aloud. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Vigorously, vigorously share the peace with one another now. <laughs> As you take your seats and wrap up in another layer of a blanket or something, you know, next, next week we'll see people starting to turn up with hats and scarves, I guess. Um, just keep remembering the mot motto that there is no wrong weather, just wrong clothing. So, 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 keep, <laughs> so keep wrapping up. Um, my name's Liz and I'm the rector here and it's delightful to have you with us this morning. A particular warm welcome, warm welcome to all um, who are visiting with us. And so a couple of announcements. First of all, well done. You all remembered that church was at 10 o'clock today. Very well done. That was excellent. And uh, it will be the same next week and the week thereafter. So we'll stick with 10 o'clock. It's uh, a better time. In two weeks' time is November the 7th, and um, we will be remembering All Saints Day on November the 7th. So just a reminder that if there is someone whom you have loved and lost or who's gone to be with the Lord this, in this last year, please send Amy their photograph and their dates, and um, we will be putting together uh, a document which we can all remember together, those whom we love. Also on November 7th is child safety training. So if particularly during the COVID season, your child safety training has lapsed. Please sign up. Jenny will be doing that training after church. Um, there's an added incentive. We're add offering lunch to those who sign up. And we do think everyone at Incarnation should be child safety trained. So um, if you've never been trained or if you have lapsed, please sign up to do that child safety training on the 7th. Uh, we've been thinking a lot recently about the ways that we pray as a community. So another just exhortation that if you can pause on either Tuesday and or Thursday at noon, we do Zoom noonday prayer. It uh, just takes 15 minutes. And if you can time your lunch hour to be then it's a lovely way of just breaking up the day and the week to pray together as a community. At the end of the service, there'll be a brief announcement from the vestry, so we won't rush away. It'll, uh, it won't take long, so just encourage you, as once we finish communion, just to linger just for a little longer at the end of the service. And again, just a very, very warm welcome to all. Um, it, and if you're at, towards the back, obviously, you know, if you've got feedback about this new setup and if you can't ever hear, just always remember to come and tell us, tell David or James, whoever's on AV, and we can adjust and make sure that this is a welcoming space for all in the weeks ahead. And now if you are so minded, you're very welcome to give to Incarnation and there are ways to do so on your song sheet. And hear this word from the Lord. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due unto his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Let us come to the table together. Holy Spirit, come to us. Kindle in us the fire of your love. Holy Spirit, come to Holy Spirit, come to us. Holy Spirit, come to us. Kindle in us the 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of now your own have, have we given, given you. you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to, to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty worthy, worthy have a seat. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. 
We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same, Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite the people who are going to be serving communion to come up and join me here and get themselves ready. And this table is open to all who are baptized and following Jesus. And there will be three stations. A gluten-free one will be just here, but otherwise um, there'll be two stations here and one at the back over there. And you'll be invited by the ushers or just go ahead and go move to the station when you are ready to receive. And if you uh, want to receive, just put your hands up and we'll dip the wafer and then pop it in your hands. If you just want a prayer, then just cross your arms and we will pray a prayer of blessing over you. And of course, you're welcome to stay where you are. And if you want to stay where you are and get communion, just wave and we'll make sure that we come to you. bread drink this cup come to him and never be hungry eat this bread drink this cup come to him and you will not thirst eat this bread cup come to him and never be hungry eat this bread drink this cup come to him and you will not thirst eat this bread drink Come to him and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup. Come to him and you will not thirst. Eat this bread. 
this bread, drink this cup, come to him and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to him and you will not thirst. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to him and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to him and you Let us pray together the prayer of thanksgiving on page 137. 137. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom, and now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. Um, as always, there'll be a team of prayer warriors ready to pray with you on any matter at the um, picnic table over there shortly. And the six pluses will be gathering over here. But first of all, we just want to ask you to just linger for a moment as the vestry have got something they want to say to you. Great. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. And Liz, would you come up and join us too? Good. Yeah, so um, this is your vestry. Um, one of us is missing, Jenny McSwain. Our three newest members, or we have Caitlin, Corey, Tom, who are new. Jenny, who is, was reelected. Ben and I are your wardens. And so we would like to talk with you for a moment. So it was about a month ago that our beloved rector, Liz, publicly announced her intent to step down from that role next spring as she and Simon plan to return to their home country to their, and to their family in the UK after 15 plus years here in the US. So amidst a wave of grief at the prospect of losing Liz, you might have begun wondering what is the process for appointing her successor? And since all of you will have memorized the incarnation bylaws and you will know that buried deep in there is a statement that it's the role of the vestry. One role of the vestry is to appoint the rector. And so you also might be thinking uh, that, on, that this new vestry was elected the same day that Liz announced her intent publicly. You might be expecting to see a, a look of panic, deer in the headlights on the faces of your new vestry. But actually, we appreciate that, but we're feeling pretty calm. And knowing that the uncertainty of succession can be exhausting, especially for a young church like ours, we wanted to begin this process as quickly as possible, knowing that it can take a long time to find a new rector. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ben. All right, thank you, Nancy. Um, so Liz told the vestry of her and Simon's um, transition timeline several weeks before the announcement um, was made to the congregation. 
Um, she'd also informed the bishop and Mary Hayes, um, who works with the diocese as the canon for congregation and clergy care. Um, so as a vestry, we were then able to start the process of selecting her successor with the um, solid and close guidance and wisdom of both Bishop John and uh, Mary Hayes, um, whom, both of which we consulted closely with uh, throughout this process. Um, so what we'd like to do today is announce that following the process recommended by the bishop and after a careful consideration of Incarnation's essential values and vision and what we need in this next season, and after due diligence and conducting a rigorous formal interview process, your vestry has selected Amy Rowe to be the next rector for Incarnation. <laughs> Uh, the bishop has approved this decision with delight, uh, and Amy has accepted, um, so she will officially become our rector next May uh, as Liz and Simon transition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a unanimous, um, enthusiastic, and clear decision by all the vestry members, um, and was met, uh, like I said, with strong delight and approval from our bishop. Um, all of you know that as our executive pastor, Amy has been a co-planter of Incarnation from the beginning. Um, and she'll be ordained to the priesthood um, later this year. Following our interview with her, uh, we were all convinced that she's the person we want to lead Incarnation into this next season. Um, she embodies a lot of what Incarnation is, um, and a lot of who we are as a church is because of Amy's contributions over the last number of years. Uh, so we're very grateful that she's willing to step into this role. Um, so then, now Nancy will give you a, more, a little more detail on the, the process we followed to come to this decision. Sure. Okay, so this may seem to you like a fast decision. Um, so in a few minutes, we're happy to take questions from any of you, and of course, over the, in the coming days, we're happy to get together with any of you individually to talk about any questions you might have about this. But right up front, I wanna just sketch out what the process was that we used to make this decision. So a very important piece of it, which is what helped us come to a decision so quickly, is that our diocese standard best practice is to first consider the suitability of any internal candidate and decide yes or no on that person before moving on to any external search. So that was what our bishop recommended. So that's what we did. But before considering Amy, on October 2nd, which was the first day our vestry, our new vestry met together, we met with Mary Hayes. And she banished Liz from the room. And just think for a minute how hard that was for Liz to not be in the room. And hard for us to not have Liz with us in that room. Uh, but she wanted us to think as an independent uh, vestry th about three things. One, what is essential to making incarnation what it is? Second, what needs to grow if we are to be who we say we are and who we want to be as a church? And then third, what do we need in our next leader? So this was a very encouraging and even inspiring exercise for us. As a vestry, we experienced a remarkable degree of unity amongst ourselves in our responses to these questions. And this gave us great clarity on what we were looking for in our next leader. So this was a very helpful thing for us to do first. But then of course, Amy was a very obvious and strong internal candidate. And we were delighted then and grateful that she was interested in being the next shepherd for this flock. And with great courage, Amy raised her hand for our consideration. So Ben has already told you the result of all of that. So we will be sending this announcement out by email shortly in a few minutes so that our entire community will know uh, about this decision. And remember, the tr transition won't happen until next May. So. They're not going anywhere yet. Um, and we view it, though, the fact that we came to a decision so quickly, this is God's great mercy to us, that we won't be distracted by this uncertainty in this season of, of other transitions that we're making. And we have seven months to sort out how it will all work and how Amy will assemble her team uh, to minister in this, in this place uh, into the coming years. And so we now want to let Liz and then Amy say a few words, and then we can stay for questions. But I will just say 
Thanks be to God. Alleluia. <laughs> Alleluia. Oh my goodness, you can't even begin to imagine how hard it was being excluded from all of that. I had so many opinions and I wanted to get, have them all heard loud and clear. But really a huge thank you to the vestry. Uh, Jenny is here sort of in hologram at the end here. But uh, they have worked so hard and although it looks quick on the outside, on the inside there were hours and hours and hours of meetings and thinking and praying and working hard. So uh, just so grateful for these thoughtful, prayerful people. It's been um, um, such a lot of work for them and I also am so delighted by the outcome. If they had asked me for my list of suitable candidates there would have only been one name on it and it would have been Amy's and it would have had little sparkly lights around it and maybe some nice art on the side, maybe a poem just to represent how strongly I feel about it. Amy is an immensely wonderful woman and I I'm over the moon about the fact that she is going to be your next rector. The next chapter is going to be phenomenal with her in charge. So thank you all for the ways that you have prayed for our vestry. But let's just cheer for the vestry because they've be done such a good job. Thank you all. Uh, I don't know if you're sort of shivering in your seats the way I was, so I, I really won't say very much. I'm just very grateful to the vestry, very grateful to Liz, very grateful to this church, and I love you all. I'm really excited for this next chapter. Yay! So let's eat and play and things like that. 